perfecting the brand of American medicine. Uh, it's a great passion in my life. I hope it's a passion uh, for you as well. Part of the goal of uh, this movie, this documentary, is to help uh, impassion you uh, for perfecting the brand of American medicine. Uh, there's more that every one of us can do. Uh, there were 103 good doctor traditions here in America and across the world before the Cold War. The Cold War shrunk that from 103 down to two, uh, of which we have here in America the best doctors the world's ever known. But we're missing 101 other tribes worth of good doctors, worth of good doctoring. And what was lost, what was lost was a prioritization of the Hippocratic Oath. That prioritization is important because those wonderful doctors that we have are 66% fewer than what we had 100 years ago, and they're asked to be everything to everybody. So we can do better. Mostly I want to convince you that we can do better. And one of the most important changes is to free doctors from non-scientific units of management. One of the most interesting things uh, is our DVOS calendar. So we had the, those of you that are old enough to remember, the Y2K glitch. Well, there's going to be another glitch in 2038. And so it's time to do something different. It turns out that uh, you can use the metric system to create a time system so we don't have these routine problems in computing. The you know base 12, base 60 timing systems aren't scientific. They're not metric. They don't help doctors. They do nothing for us. And so what we've done in our DVOS calendar is we've provided a metric calendar. Uh, that actually functions for physicians. That's something we want to talk to you about uh, in your medical office, in your hospital, is the DBOS calendar. You bring medical science into the science of time, uh, where the science of time has been filled with a, a lot of folklore, uh, a lot of um, non-scientific opinion, and uh, we can take you on an archaeological journey. Uh, to get your practice ready for the future uh, in managing time. I'm David Jules. I'm the CEO of Profit.me. Uh, we work for doctors and hospital groups, and we work with medical group, uh, medical suppliers, like a lot of you other folks that are listening. Uh, our website is Profit.me. Uh, we'd love for you to participate with us. Um, we've created seven chivalric orders based on those old 103 good doctor traditions that prioritize the Hippocratic Oath in a way that's meaningful and purposeful so that doctors know what the top priority is. That's important for a lot of reasons. Number one, the physician is not the victim of being sued because the doctor says, well, you know, I'm Epicurean First Medicine. Was I Epicurean? You were. Okay, well, you can't sue me for not being Epicurean. You know, I was Epicurean. I mean, you, if you had a service upset, we can find some accommodation or understanding in that. But as a period, because one of the things you'll see is that the lawsuit system in America traces back, um, and we'll talk about it, to the Dutch West India Company. Because see, Albany and New Amsterdam in modern New York were uh, operated by pirates. They were part of the Dutch West India Company. Uh, they had a Duke of Albany. They had a Duke of Amsterdam. Uh, me and my ancestors came here in 1773. The battalions. Uh, Jones the Great Battalion came in 1773. And he made a long pass through what was called New Amsterdam Harbor. And he didn't like what he saw. It was a lawless, riparian place. And, you know, he was the king of Prussia. You know, he was the Batavian where he was the figurehead of Yagalonian law, which means the, the rider, the knight, the white knight conqueror. And he looked on shore and he didn't like what he saw. And he said, you know what I can do? I know I can go upstream of New Amsterdam. I know I can ascend as Duke of York over all these people. We'll probably even rename this place New York after I take Albany. And that's what he did. He built West Point 
where he put all of his family's silver in West Point. It's still there from 1773. The silver that paid for the American Revolution is still sitting there at West Point. Because he looked at what New Amsterdam was and what Albany was, and he said, there's no way we're going to let pirates run this continent. We're going to run this continent with civility, like we do back in Europe. He was the general of the Continental Army, which meant Europe. And in 1773, when he came here, it also meant America. That's Jonas Scrapitavia. His grandson was Napoleon Bonaparte III, which is incredibly important because he was the guy that founded the Lingua Franca era. And there's so many people are familiar with the Lingua Franca era and they can't place who was the reason there was the Lingua Franca era. Well, the reason there's Lingua Franca is that Napoleon Bonaparte III controlled West Point, controlled Paris. He's emperor of all the world. He gave aid to the Union during the Civil War. You know, he used to... Um, sail retail barges up the Mississippi River to all those Icarus towns, or uh, stylized Icarus towns, where individuals like my ancestor, Dr. Martha Berry Spaulding, who is, you know, she was born in 1836, which had her practicing medicine before the Civil War, including one of her patients was their next door neighbor, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, we have photographs of the Lincoln kids right here in the family, family photo album, in the Spaulding uh, photo album. Her husband, uh, W.J. Spaulding, the divine, uh, was uh, Abraham Lincoln's minister. And I'll put some of the photos up uh, on the, uh, for you guys to view. But for instance, you know, that's a photo of Jack Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's son, who lived right next door to us in Mount Pleasant, Iowa. And the reason that that's so cool is that the Republic was born in Mount Pleasant, Iowa, on my mother's side. West Point was built uh, on the cadet line on my father's side. And it's a story that's so remarkable, it's hardly ever told. But the, the Republic and the Republican Party was a phenomenon of W.J. Spaulding, Dr. Martha Barry Spaulding, and an unknown uh, local patient of Dr. Martha, Martha Barry Spaulding and a parishioner of W.J. Spaulding named Abraham Lincoln, who spent his summers in Mount Pleasant, Iowa. That is be so important in the context of Italian history because there were seven like chivalric orders that existed before the Civil War that helped determine good outcomes for homo sapiens. And that's shrunk down if you look across profession. In accounting, there's only one or two professions left. So, accountant comes from the Dutch, um, you know, for accounting. The, you know, bookkeeper comes from England, where England had myths about, um, you know, keepers in hell, keeping books. And that's what bookkeeper comes from. And those are the only now. real traditions that exist. And yet there are 103 good accountants or good accounter traditions. We've seen so many, you know, accounting scandals in the last, you know, 20, 30 years that it's time that we look for something better. You don't have to look farther than, you know, Napoleon Bonaparte III. Uh, Joe Scriptavin, who had a conscious system, of which in our Devos calendar we reintroduce some of the old Econor systems. Yet I swear and uh, I with some mind of medical science, um, we attach new Econor systems that are useful in helping manage lar large organizations with large numbers of people. And that's something we like to talk to you about appropriately. So the Devos calendar includes. A seven day week with one chivalric order dedicated to each day of the week, where uh, these new O'Connor systems are introduced to your organization, to your leadership, to your people in a methodical way to reintroduce those Good Shepherd traditions that made Europe great, that made America great, and were lost 
uh, by the coincidence the Cold War. Now, and in so doing, we can also help in this revisit those seven crowd. traditions of good doctrine that are missing, who swears where the Hippocratic Oath is a priority. Epicurean first, workability first, All day long life expectancy first, him a shout ability so first, cure first, first Just night first, crying out that he was brave. and law first. That's the things that excite me in you know, perfecting brain rate in medicine is introducing a new calendar uh, into your clinic that doesn't appeal to the hocus pocus, um, Seven you know, the liturgy. 12 base unit system, 60 base unit system. We have a 10 base unit system Any that a day is divided into now. with um, you know, two week, you know, bi weekly financial forecasts. If you, you look at your, you know, your bright guy. Which we know a lot of real bright guys. Uh, you know, if you're a Jim Scogsberg, who we respect greatly at Edgar Rural Healthcare, you know, I had the pleasure of working for him some time ago. Um, you know, we uh, we were proposed that we'd love to, you know, do business with Advocate again. We found them to be a great partner. They had been so successful with some of the tools that we implemented. And uh, one of the things that I like sharing with executives at his level is if you look back over your whole career, how many of those financial variances that were discussed at your board meetings count like originate from variation in the number of work days in the month from this year versus last year? And what you'll find is over half of financial variances that like don't have a systematic cause of just like, oh, well, we end up growing way more revenue. Well, but it, you know, other than like revenue growth related or revenue shrink, and ad advocate is mostly growth, over half of the variation that you see in financial statements is like, oh, you know what? Last year there were, you know, two fewer days in the month of January, there were work days. That's all it was. So people weren't posting charges or anything. Well, see, that doesn't make sense for a business calendar. It also doesn't make sense, you know, when you look back at 1582 of the Common Era, the Gregorian calendar skipped 10 days. So for those, you know, my friends at Advocate Aurora Healthcare that are uh, faith-based uh, individuals, uh, Sunday isn't even what Sunday was. Today's Thursday is what Sunday was for 1500 years before the 1580s, which is so important. And so in our calendar, we have a correcting system that allows the first day of the year to be the first day um, of the calendar for the whole year. And so organizations are allowed to make small shifts and they can change what day they find to be the holy day, you know, over a long period of time, over a seven year plan, over a 14 year plan. And that's important for those that are very, you know, fundamentalist about what's right. Because um, that's what mission, vision, and values are all about. And it's one of the opportunities, one of the possibilities for the DBOS calendar is to make right the counting errors that were wrong in the past. I'm so excited to talk to you about Perfecting the Brand of American Medicine. The book is an e-book. It's on sale at profi.me. Um, any one of your employees, every one of your employees, any one of your partners, every one of your partners will enjoy the book. Um, you know, we're happy to offer suggestions um, on help to perfect uh, your company's brand of American medicine. Join us at Profi.me. Tavi Medici Latin is such an important new doctrine and historic liturgy describing, um, you know, out of what were 103 good shepherd, good doctor traditions of what was lost during the Cold War that needs to be regained. Batavi Medici Latin is the Epicurean first medicine uh, that was there before the Cold War. You know, medical doctors, osteopaths, unfortunately, are asked to be everything to everybody. And so we're offering uh, this new chivalric order uh, of Epicurean first medicine. For patients that want to enjoy the sights, the sounds, the experience of being cared for, and for physicians that want to care for patients like that. 
and that they match and have that clear shared value. And we can dedicate a whole day to it. We can dedicate Sunday to it. That's a great tradition for it. The Batava Medici Latin doctrine includes new accounter systems. I talked about before the Cold War, there were 103 different accounting systems, different uh, good accountants, of which that shrunk down to two, of which bookkeeping came from the British uh, pirates. I mean, in the meanwhile, I just said, you know, British folks, but they thought, you know, bookkeepers were, you know, like devil keepers. Like, you know, they had, you know, myths about, like, spirits that manage their books, their bookkeepers, which is goofy. And, you know, at least 102 other tribes don't agree with it. The other tradition that survived is the uh, certified public accountant path, which that traces back to the Dutch. And I mean, America famously defeated the, the Redcoats and the Dutch at the American Revolution. And we built the Brandenburg Gate right there in Germany to remind everybody that all the people of all the continents of the world defeated pirates in 1787. Which included kicking them out of New Amsterdam, which became New York. Which included kicking them out of Albany. And there are also 20,000 continental soldiers that marched on Holland uh, to quell the rebellion. And where they, they happened to rename the Republic, the Batavian Republic, after an ancestor of mine on the cadet line. Jonas the Great Batavian. But so we have new encounter systems that have this great tradition. The first one is the enteric counter system, which the, the enteric nervous system uh, is one of the most important nervous systems in your whole body. You know, up until some time ago, you know, when I started lecturing on it, it was commingled the parasympathetic nervous system as if they're the same thing, and they're not. The enteric nervous system is a complete nervous system. And, you know, that, that there's a whole a counter, a whole accounting system that unifies quality and finance in your enteric account, you know, nervous system. So it's an accounting system based on your nervous system, which in medicine makes sense. Having diagnoses and billing codes based on that makes sense. The second new counter system is the somatic counter, which comes from the somatic nervous system, uh, which is largely orthopedics. And, you know, it makes sense for orthopedics to have an orthopedics-based counter system. And not to be borrowing, you know, from other systems, from other specialties. You know, for, for the lingo. You know, because, you know, orthopedics deserves to have its own counter system. There were orthopedics and counter systems. You know, Jones Great Batavian built the first orthopedic hospital in America at West Point to care for the uh, Revolutionary War uh, heroes that were injured. He was actually a good doctor. That was actually very common. That's part of his hero's journey. The third O'Connor system for Batavia Medici Latin is Thermoconner. You know, thermodynamic is part of the cellular energy O'Connor, which is, you know, I elaborate in my book, you know, Metabolic Topology, that, you know, we don't describe the thermodynamic transactions that result in changes in things like body mass. What nutritional choices result in changes in body mass? And the evidence on it is confusing and misleading, even for physicians. And I, I, you know, I assure you there is a thermoconner system that, you know, you don't need a certified public accountant. Your orthopedic group isn't certified, it's not public, it's not accountant. You guys are licensed physicians. You're not publicly traded, and you don't need an accountant. Now, me, I have a Master's of Healthcare Administration. I've written 13 books on medicine, on medical science. They're well socialized, they're peer reviewed. Uh, you know, I wrote the fee schedule for Kaiser Permanente, you know, when I was a young puppy in my 20s. You know, I've written fee schedules for, you know, orthopedic surgeons all across America, run their business office for them. We want to do that for you. You know, same for GI docs in the Enter O'Connor. We help GI docs run their business office on an Enter O'Connor system rather than, you know, Asking some, I don't mean it in a mean way, because like I have Dutch and British ancestry, but we don't need input from the Redcoats and the Dutch West India Company on what our accounting system should be in medicine. And yet, we won the American Revolution, and slowly, through civil reconstruction, we lost the American 
uh, good Akantra systems that were there in place. And it reverted back to British and Dutch systems, which, you know, for everyday Americans, that's got to piss you off. Because, you know, there are guys that, you know, laid face down in the mud just to get rid of those British and, you know, Dutch systems of accounting. Because we had better systems. Mostly I want to convince you that, you know, America's revolution was the most important event in the history of our whole species because it was Yagawoni and Love and Knights, the Kings, you know, the tradition of chivalry. The guys that built West Point, they built, you know, Batavian style podiums like that for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Podiums a French, a uh, Dutch word that means a fortress. Often with a, a treasury, often with a, um, an academy. In the case of West Point, it did have an academy. It was a classic Batavian style academy with a classic Batavian style, you know, it actually has, you know, at the time it had some of the largest silver reserves in the whole world. Because my ancestor put all the family silver in this experiment we call America. It was, you know, critical. You know, he was he was on the side of Yagalani law. And see, Dutch and British law were based on riparian law. You know, by the water. What does that mean? <laughs> riparian law is Law of the Seas, which was, you know, during the American Revolution, there was the uh, tradition of admiralty courts, admiralty law, in every town, and that is an eyesore and an embarrassment uh, to Homo sapiens, because, you know, people are not underwater, we're not fish, and, uh, you know, it's time that we, you know, embrace the continents, uh, Yagalonian law, the law of knights and kings, uh, the law of white knights, white knights on white horses, I believe in chivalry. And when we embrace that and get rid of all the riparian law, you'll find that a lot of our uh, civilization, our culture, and our field of medicine functions far better than it ever did before. And that's why we want you to join us at Batavia Medici Latin, where we have these you know, three new O'Connor systems we'd like you to join us with. Our new DVOS calendar includes a reordering of the physician's calendar in a way that makes sense for doctors, that so uses a metric system uh, rather than the old folklore and fairy tales of organizing your year in a way that doesn't make sense for you, doesn't work for you. And so Mondays, simply enough, are Kent English, Workability First Medicine. Uh, Kent is a doctrine. Kent was an uh, imperial Kent. You know, for me, Kent is also my middle name. Uh, Kent um, is a tradition of uh, ruling all the world by the seas. Uh, my ancestor, Sir Yvonne, on my mother's side, um, founded Harvard University. He's a Kent English, he's king of Kent English, habit of it, uh, where he founded Harvard University, he founded Rhode Island, he had a vision of manifest destiny spreading English all the way across America. Uh, then he had a vision of calculus where he went back to England and he invented calculus a generation before Isaac Newton did. And as he was doing that, he had a vision of a ship that didn't lag, it didn't sag in the water. Uh, he called it shapelessness, and that vision of calculus is what built the Royal British Navy that defeated the Dutch. He was one of the most important kings in the whole history of the world, uh, and he's hardly remembered. If you look at, you know, the nation of England, they hardly commemorate him anywhere. Here in the United States, we do a better job. We should do better. He has a statue at Boston Public Library, uh, but you know he. Um, was one of the most consequential and successful kings in implementing Yagamone law despite having been atop a riparian power. He was someone so moved by the law of knights and kings and was troubled by piracy, was troubled by um, what we would call like insurance, was troubled by what we would call um, like banking. And you know, he was an individual that was incredibly moral. Um, and, um, you know, he happened to have been martyred uh, after being held in the town, in, in the Tower of London in 1662. You know, 1661, 1662, he was held in the Tower of London and then executed in front of his own people. One of the few examples of that through the whole history of the world. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a few things about that that are so troubling. You know, the first is that the coincidence was that Rembrandt, the 
painter, the Dutch painter, over the same period of time, had a worse nightmare they couldn't get out of his mind. He had a worse nightmare at the downfall of the Dutch Golden Age. This is 1661, 1662. And so Rembrandt is down there in Holland painting this worst nightmare. It's his largest painting. It's called the Batavian. We had this worst nightmare that the, the law knights and kings would bring down the Dutch. And in, in some metaphysical way, well, Rembrandt was tortured with this worst nightmare. Sarni Vaughan was incarcerated by his own people, where he was the top, arguably the, you know, number one or number two most dominant naval power in the world. It was either the British or the Dutch. It's it it such a remarkable story. 111 years later, my ancestor on my father's side, you know, arrives here in the United States and builds West Point, which is exactly who Rembrandt had painted. He painted the Batavian. He had a vision of the Batavian, the old Lithuanian knights and kings that had come and bring down the Dutch Golden Age. And that's exactly what happened. And uh, so 1661, 1662 are such consequential years. And you know, Sarni Vaughan, you know, is such an important figure and not discussed, not in the monarchy, not in parliament, and yet, you know, you, you cannot kill the king and say you are king. And for those, that's, you know, that work in healthcare that see, like, transition, where there's sloppy transitions and later, we understand that you cannot kill the king and say you are king. And one of the most important things for us to get right is that Sir Henry Vaughan's line is the proper line to the throne of England. It always was. Uh, he was martyred in front of his own people in an absolutely unprecedented um, and unjust act. You know, where he, you know, founded Harvard University. He made popularized English throughout the United States. He rose the Red Cross over the barracks in Boston, which in his mind, the Knights Hospitalier looked over the colonists in the New World to protect them. That's where the Red Cross, as we talk about today, comes from, with Sir Yvonne raising the Red Cross in Boston. He had a vision of calculus, and he modernized the British Navy. He, he's an incredibly successful figure, and then needlessly martyred, uh, you know, through, um, you know, slander, through this um, fascinating and terrible coincidence between Sir Yvonne and Rembrandt, where Rembrandt is painting this worst nightmare of the downfall of riparian powers. And then the Batavian, well, Sir Yvonne is being held captive. And um, it says something about our species, or it says something about art, or it says something about um, on Mondays, we can talk about the doctrine of Ken English, where English is the language of the liturgy, where Sir Yvonne, King Henry X, um, you know, is a martyred Christ English. And we talk about workability first medicine, because it's useful. Because in workability, you deal with people that claim they're martyrs but aren't. And that's a whole field of medicine that we used to have before the Cold War was we had workability first medicine. We had Kent English doctors that were entirely there to motivate you to get back to work. And that style of medicine way decreased uh, throughout the Cold War. And there were a lot of laws that were passed and you know, garbage got in the way of it. There's a whole field of medicine um, that was there to... Uh, help with workability. And uh, that's the Ken English tradition. We celebrate that on Mondays in honor uh, Sir Henry Vaughan, uh, you know, King Henry X, founder of Harvard, the proper king of English, founded Rhode Island, modernized British Navy, you know, envisioned uh, a Royal Navy built on calculus that ultimately defeated the Dutch. That's where we honor him on the Divas calendar for Mondays. Join us at Profi.me with our DBOS calendar and uh, with all the inspiration we can draw from the life of Sir Henry Vaughan. You cannot kill the king and say you are king. There were knights that founded America. America was built on chivalry. Uh, Sir Edward Spaulding was one of those knights that came to America, uh, came to the Jamestown, Virginia colony, uh, which sadly, uh, through sickness, virus, famine uh, and other um, acts of nature you know, which they perceived as like 
the apocalypse. The Jamestown, Virginia colony was starved out, was hungered out, was diseased out. Sir Edward Spaulding was there on the last day and the last meal at Jamestown, Virginia, where, you know, in what defied his own values as an American, as English, they resorted to eating the horses rather than save off, rather than starve off, to be precise. So Sir Edward Spaulding was a survivor of the Last Supper in Jamestown, Virginia, where he later escaped up to New England, which had survived, and with Sir Edward Spaulding and Sir Ernie Vaughan in Massachusetts at the same time, some remarkable things happened. Where, you know, Harvard was founded, Edward Spaulding founded Needham, Massachusetts, which expanded out into uh, Connecticut and had English speakers on down the road in Connecticut and even, you know, on directionally towards what we now call New York, although it's called New Amsterdam then. It was called Albany then, it was called Vermont, you know, called Vermont now. Edward Spaulding also, uh, Sir Edward Spaulding also founded uh, Kelmsford, Massachusetts, which um, became New Hampshire. It uh, sort of became Western Maine. And in some ways it you know, continued on and became the parts of Canada that are on the side of the seaway. The parts of originated from his road building, which is so critical. Edward Spaulding, you know, was uh, at the Last Supper, and, you know, the vast majority of people at Jamestown, Virginia, didn't make it. I mean, there's hospitals, there's clinics, there's physicians that are drying up in that, you know, metaphysically in that same way, where administration or nursing or patients are eating the horse. You know, Hippocrates is a thing that's great. You know, America has the best physicians the world's ever known. I wrote a book about it. It's called Perfecting the Brand of American Medicine. There are other traditions of medical sex. There are other, you know, seven chivalric orders before the Cold War. Out of 103 good doctor traditions before the Cold War that we can revisit that are worthwhile for every doctor out there to consider. We've dedicated a whole day of it on the DBOS calendar to Atlantis America. Life expectancy first medicine. In the last 10 years, life expectancy for Americans has decreased. Life expectancy has not proven one directional non reversible. You know, Sir Edward Spaulding could test it. As he watched everybody in Jamestown die off from the state. And he certainly tried to help. Them. The chivalry at the end. So, um, in that spirit of Jamestown, Virginia, uh, we've created a, an emotive topology, um, you know, a confessicon or system uh, to help health systems gauge, you know, where their people are on, you know, issues of trust, patience, gratitude, happiness, reasonableness, inquisitiveness, and on down towards some of the more destroying emotions. You know, surprised without Ghent. You know, people are surprised without seizing the day. 
sadness without Sita, which I elaborate on uh, in my book. We'd love to share that with you and your organization. Having fear without pre. Again, we, we talk about that in our book. We'd love to share that with your organization. Anger without angst, which I think is so important. Disgust without goosebent. Because see, um, I have a problem solving toolkit I elaborate on in Perfecting the Brand American Medicine. Uh, it's called Suspect. Uh, it's like, uh, you know, Seurat, the French painter, the pointless painter, uh, of which you know, he had a vision of painting a whole canvas uh, with a small number of dots, and then standing far away, you'd be able to connect the dots and see the whole. And it was a, a brilliant way of deceiving the person up front and providing a masterpiece at a distance which is the old Rangan tradition uh, you know, of knights from range. And that's, Goosebeck is an acronym, uh, which means uh, to taste, to choose. Energy, units of measure, seconds. Process, expectations, cycles, qualities. There are a lot of organizations that are very process focused, and they miss the whole point of continuous improvement by missing where expectations are missed, where cycles are missed, where support qualities are missed, which I elaborate uh, in perfecting the brand record medicine and metabolic topology. And uh, having discussed offset with goosebent, we become tastemakers, you know, choice makers, is one of the ways to you know, pull, you know, pull up on that about a sinking airplane. And then, you know, contempt. Contempt is a malpractice for risk emotion. It's part of that emotional topology uh, that we talk about, that we elaborate on. Uh, you know, it's a cause of malpractice. And it's not the only cause. A lot of causes. You know, the physician dress me everything to everybody. The physician were told that there were 103 good doctor traditions in America visit them, that there's seven chivalric orders that have been there all along, you know, we're still here, and that Tuesdays are dedicated to those doctors that want to be in American doctrine, Atlantis, American, life expectancy first medicine, and want to be involved in the, the new confessor counter system, you know, and that emotional topology I talked about. The Kurdic honor system is so much of increasing life expectancy is taking better care of our heart, taking better care of our soul. And that's what we want to talk to your organization about. And I'm David Tools, you know, CEO of Profit. I mean, uh, we're promoting my book, you know, Perfecting Brand American Medicine, uh, and our new DDoS calendar, which helps physicians have um, a new option for accounting. Um, one of them is novel, is a, 
go to the contour system, um, which is looking at what your body's cellular needs are at the level of the horse, at the level of your routine. Uh, for those of uh, you that are real strict medical science, for those of you that are you know, your mitochondria. Because, you know, ability first medicine is about providing your cellular life. Your brain can't experience the same with all the nutrients that it is qualitatively different than what your brain wants, different than what your you know, enteric system wants, qualitatively different than any um, parasites in your body might or might not be done in causing uh, you know, hunger pains. And so Jotina Olympic is going for you to strike back with a Jotina Contour System. It's also a brand of medicine for those of you that are cardiologists, for those of you that are psychiatrists, to you know, candor a counter. So you're using straight data with individuals. There's a segment of patients that just want straight data, want to talk straight to it doesn't have to be sugar coated, and that's the Jotin Olympic style. High, individuals that are highly coachable, um, individuals that respect medicine, especially uh, you know that are like very low likelihood individuals of suing a physician, you know, because they like and respect it. And that's what Jotin Olympic is about. You know, a sports medicine doctor that wants to you know deal with able people rather than sick people. You want to get um, you know individuals in the Olympics, you want to get individuals into Division One athletics programs, scholarships. That's a body of medicine that's there for the whole world. There's other countries that do that remarkably well. Uh, and you know, what's so interesting is that uh, we've migrated away from them. And because you know, we've asked doctors to do everything to everybody. And so it varies all over America. And yet Joe Olympic is this uh, you know, new medical sack, uh, you know, based on the old, one of the old South and Shovel recorded now, it's one of the good doctor traditions that were there before the Cold War that we're bringing back and we're dedicated a little bit of each on Wednesdays in the d calendar. We want you to join us at Profit on Me and be a part of it. Um, have your secretary, your administrator reach out to us. Uh, we'd love to schedule time and share the book, Perfecting the Brand of American Medicine, uh, with you and your whole team. It's on ebook now. Hi again, I'm David Tills, the CEO of Profi.me. I happen to be the author of uh, multiple books. One of them is uh, Metabolic Topology, uh, which is a vision of a uh, new medical sect uh, that's cure-first medicine. There were such medical sects before the Cold War. There were 103 good doctor traditions before the Cold War. Uh, and through the Cold War, America became more socialist and the USSR became more free market. Both of us lost so many of our medical sects. Um, you know, under a lot of different auspices. Regardless, um, the Baltic Jag Fedek tradition was there, of which uh, that is the tradition that unified dentistry and uh, what I'd call uh, enteric medicine. You know, enteric is a medical science. Uh, the closest analog would be gastroenterology, but it's not the bulk of what they do. And so, um, there's Baltic Jagfetic doctors that are trained to be dentists and doctors. And actually, um, you can't actually treat what people eat without treating how people eat. You can't treat people's teeth and what they choose to eat um, without treating people's stomachs and the rest of their body, what they're putting in their body. And what's really interesting is that the experiment of trying to break dentistry away from of that field of medicine uh, has been a disaster. You know, when we take so many medications, um, you know, and our, our dentists and doctors disagree on them. Like, if, if you went between your dentist and your doctor on any one food item, in light of any one or condition, you'd find that they disagree such a remarkable amount of time that you, you could do almost nothing else than asking your dentist and your doctor what, what's right. Because dentists and doctors don't agree. Why? Because they have different scope. They've been relieved of a scope that was an old time thing that actually functioned better. And, you know, and it was around back when people were living longer. You know, in the last 10 years or so, life expectancy in America has decreased. And 
part of it is that we don't have a medical sect that's called Cure First Medicine. You know, if you look back, there is though, and I elaborate on Perfecting the Brand of American Medicine. It's the best book written for healthcare professionals, whether you're a doctor or not, a nurse or not, an administrator or not. It's an excellent book. And we talk about topologies, which is the language of cures. And one of those opportunities is, you know, metabolic topology. So, you know, metabolic is the doctrine, uh, as in, you know, how your body metabolizes all the way through. Not just the process of eating like a dentistry, you know, cleaning like a dentistry, but, you know, how your body absorbs and makes nutrients bioavailable. And that whole system is so critical to understanding homo sapien health and is such a clear and salient picture of what is not working in America's healthcare system right now that we want to inspire you to join us. There's not a single medical school in America that teaches the Baltic Jagfetic tradition that unifies dentistry and medicine. And that's something we'd like to reintroduce. Me, I have to have been a veterinary anesthesiologist. I was a veterinary uh, pharmacologist. I was a um, veterinary biochemist. Um, that's sort of how I came across that body of knowledge of science, of logic. And I, you know, I happen to be the set of folks that had um, a unification of dentistry and medicine. sense than anything else and everything else that ever, you know, attached meaning on Thursday. So join us uh, with our DBOS calendar. Join us at Perfecting the Brand American Medicine. Join us with Metabolic Topology. We're launching an old time and new time metabolic topology tradition that unifies dentistry and medicine to cure individuals of disease. So the doctors and dentists, you know, if they're the same person, they can agree. You know, our eggs good? Ask your dentist. Are eggs good? Ask your doctor. I mean, you can go back and forth for a long time. And so, we gotta do better. That's one way where you can't do dentistry and like medicine and goes nutrition separately. You gotta do them together. Let's do this. You know, America, we can do this. I know we can do this. Join us at Profi.me. program today you know Western civilizations didn't learn anything from Japan Japan missed the first three Iron Ages they don't have a great Iron Age tradition they borrowed language and borrowed iron from other cultures there's 103 good shepherd traditions good blacksmith tra traditions they go back tens of thousands of years and Japan is very new to the party and literally only claimed that they had some great tradition of iron and steel in the last hundred years, especially since 1941, as if somebody ever did something wrong. Um, you know, Japan, no disrespect. You know, we, I'm talking about the government. You know, you know Japan's government and Toyota, Toyota's leadership, failed the parable of the three little pigs, you know, where they built their cities out of straw and wood and bombed the culture 
that made its cities out of steel and out of brick. The leading expected aesthetic system comes from is this tradition. The leading expect occurred to me because I became troubled that the Hippocratic movement has not moved life expectancy upward in one direction, that America life expectancy has recently waned. This map does not have a mind of its own, it must be led by humankind. I choose the word leading as an action verb, I choose the word expect for many of its organic connotations, professional services, where people are serving people. Only happy, loyal, engaged people, smart people, can make happy, loyal, engaged patients, smart patients. Nothing else does, and nothing else can, and nothing else ever did. You don't need people that, you know, fueled up the bombers in Burl Harbor to explain that to you. That knowledge is already here in America, we built West Point. You know, we brought down the Dutch West India Company. You know, we fought off the Red Coats. Join us at Leading Expect Jake Fedek. It's a human-centered system of design that differentiates bridges that are directional in a process, repeatable in a cycle, or reversible in its apology. Leading Expect is trans-evident in that it is open to possibilities, integrates changes into medical science, in transits in that it is focused not just on extending life, but on making things better for the next generation. Leading Expect makes the promise to extend life in two ways. The marathon of efforts to extend life expectancy. Leading Expect reduces the demand for firefighting, literally and figuratively, and meeting all of your demands for goals. You own the dynasty of American exceptionalism in medical science. That's, that's right, you, the operator, the administrator, the nurse, the physician. And your reputation's been sullied you know, where life expectancy declined for over a decade now. By like 1961, East German bureaucracy, non-operable electronic medical records, the disembodiment of patients into lean manufacturing, which is brought to you by, you know, the guys that failed the parable of the three little pigs. Let that set in. You know, we let the Mr. Magoo of the, you know, the bombers, you know, the bomb Pearl Harbor, you know, guide health policy in America. Will Rogers said, if pro is the opposite of con, what's the opposite of progress? Congress? Help the continents point to Europe? The model? The healthcare that the European Union has no plan to implement. A single pair for the continent? The divided Congress means we don't have one yet. California could do Italy. New York could do like Germany. But Texas won't spontaneously become France. You know, bookkeeping, which is a British um, system, and you know, I have British ancestors, so I can say it. I mean, like, it's a pirate-based system. You know, like insurance and banks feel foreign because they, you know, originate from British covenant. That's why they feel foreign to Americans, though. Is you know, it's built on you know, a philosophy of piracy. Whereas those, you know, continental powers before were different. And
best of it back home uh, to your practice, to your hospital, to your physician group, to your practice of medicine. It's what we're trying to do is expand uh, people's access to the DBOS County all of the benefits of it. Uh, and you can reach me at probate.me. Uh, you know, we're trying to reach out to those doctors, those physicians that want to stop being everything to everybody. Those hospital ministers want to stop being everything to everybody. Natural law was law. Americans want legal sex, want a Hippocratic domain over the field of law. That's the way that things were. America had knights at its founding. Jagfetic, the language, the liturgy, the people uh, where chivalry originated, brought us divine law, uh, divas law, sacred, non-cynical kingdom building. That's something that Americans fundamentally want. Americans want real, sacred law that enriches people's lives. That requires an oath. It requires oaths of those that are practicing law. That's other than what's going on today. Divas included. Messiah of Oaths is an ancient Jagfetic legend. That's an ancient language of horse shepherds, which is the divine twins law. It predicted the Iron Ages. It predicted the Bronze Ages, and it predicted prior Hippocratic Ages, which we can enter a new Hippocratic Age with this new DeVos calendar. There are new calculus doctrines that meet the expectations for being sacred, enriching lives, and an oath. Uh, one for every day of the week. Kent English, Atlantis American, Jotin Olympic, Metabolic Topology, Leading Expect Jagfetic, Hippocratic French, and Batavian Medici Latin. There were no bar association attorneys at America's Fund. Uh, you know, America has one kind of lawyer in its Juris Doctorate. Um, cult. It's a cult of um, barber law, is what it would have been called. Uh, reading law. Um, which falls short of what's law. Um, answer me this. How could so many people take constitutional law um, you know, at these you know, bar association uh, accredited law schools and not one of them realized that there was not a single bar association attorney at America's founding and therefore there's no predicate for it and there's no jurisprudence for it and there's absolutely no reason that any uh, you know jurist doctorate any bar association law has any right to practice law anywhere in America now maybe they could petition to get practice in um, Canada or in Mexico but in America we actually have standards we have quality standards um, in the Bar Association, uh, since um, the Civil War, uh, what happened was in New York and Pennsylvania, um, and again, I'm, I'm Dutch, and so I'm not saying anything that's untoward. The Dutch individuals that controlled law in the West, you know, the Dutch West India Company, you know, reached back um, after the Civil War and said, you know, well, we're not going to let non Dutch, non men practice law anymore. That's what that's who the Bar Association was. And they uh, spread um, Jim Crow law. They um, founded the NRA and they founded the KKK. It, it all originates from uh, Dutch New York, Dutch Pennsylvania, Dutch New Jersey, Dutch Delaware um, attorneys during Civil War Reconstruction who thought they were better than all of these. And every member of the Bar Association who support today because uh, literally all of our society still originated from the absolute immoral, morally bankrupt bar association um, accreditation, the bar association, the law the bar association. I'll elaborate on the law. You see, if you went to the state of New York, you said, well, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to accredit all of the cement mixing and cement pouring in the whole state of New York. Let's say, well, that seems like a lot. Well, I'm going to mandate that all of them test and I'm going to mandate that all of them go to a accredited, a bar association accredited college of cement. Oh, yeah. So, how does that work? Well, see, they have to pay me as a creditor and then pay me in law school and then pay me to test. See, it's a little circular there. The reason it's circular is that it is an elaborate fraud, it functions just like the mob. In fact, there's almost no functional difference 
between the Bar Association in any given state and the Mafia. The only difference is that the Mafia doesn't pretend like they run the law system. And really the Bar Association was an accident this whole reconstruction. I'll debate anybody on it. I'll debate any politician on it. I'll debate any lawyer on it. And you guys are losing. There's not a single Bar Association lawyer at American Sound. Founded the Pro, it founded the KKK. All you need to renounce your bar association degree, renounce your membership of bar association, you need to uh, shut down all of your people. Like, lots of those have done nothing to your show on Like, literally, because you learn nothing about the actual law. Because the law is a very real and sacred thing. When you look back to Homo sapiens, you look in other countries where they have you know, laws and sacred things. The law is a very important thing. It determines, like the Agamemnon law, the law of nice who lives, who dies? The Kyrie of Soul City, natural law, it explains like divine creation, like scientific law, like metabolic law, where the right way to eat, where the right way to care for yourself, where the right way to care for your family. That's what law is. Law is big law. In fact, the word king originates from good doctors. And that's you know what I want to appeal to all my doctors out there, is that prior to the Civil War, when um, a bunch of, and again, I, I have Dutch ancestry, so I can say it. You know, when, when a bunch of Dutch folks in New York, uh, New Jersey, and Delaware decided to kick non-Dutch, non-males out of practicing law, um, you know, before that point, doctors were the bulk of who saw legal cases. Because, see, a doctor would take a case. And a case could mean that it was a medical case. It could mean that it was a legal case. It could mean that they're asking him to be a judge. It could mean they're asking him to be a lawyer. It could mean they're asking him to be a litigator. And it was those that were spear and horses that were at right to practice law, which was Hippocrates. It's a Hippocratic oath. And see, the Bar Association doesn't have any such oath. And its cynicism uh, demonstrates every entropy that took everything that made America function well before the Civil War and slowly reeled it back. And like, if you look back, only because women start being reintroduced 70 years after the Bar Association was founded and non-Dutch people were introduced like two or three generations later, do people forgive it? And it's like, don't forgive it. There's no reason, you know, just like if you shut down the mob in New York, you know what I mean? You shut down the, you know, the cement accrediting agency, you, sh you know, like the Bar Association crediting of law school, you shut down the cement colleges in New York. You know, if you shut down the cement test, you know, was he one of our guys? Uh, did he study reading law? I mean, you have to look back at America's founding. The lowest caste of lawyers are reading law. How did you learn law? Oh, I read it in a book, and then I was lectured on it in class. Really? That's the most embarrassing background for a lawyer. How do you learn law? I know individuals that practice actual law. How did you learn law? Well, I read physician contracts. I read their terms and conditions. And made sure that uh, you know the organization had good out and the physician had a fair deal, and, uh, you know, all things equal. Wow, yeah, that's law. Making sure that a physician has a fair contract is actual law. You know, terms and termination for a physician contract is actual law. You could ask any bar association attorney, what what's a fair market value for a physician's time, and they couldn't answer the question. How could you possibly be practicing law if you just read about it? How could you be practicing law if at America's Founding there weren't any bar association lawyers at all? And the people that were reading lawyers were like, literally, the checkers players of the legal field. And the fact that that is how people learn law, well, how'd you learn? Well, I read it in a book. Oh yeah, well, and then what? Well, I was really good though, and I, you know, made bar of you. Oh yeah? Awesome. How did you help people? Because that's, that's what law does. The reason that people don't help people in America is that our bar association is cynical, has no mission, is not connected to the Hippocratic Oath. And frankly, for you good doctors out there, I want to convince you that there were 103 good lawyer traditions before the Civil War. All of them had doctors functioning as lawyers. None of them had barber attorneys functioning as lawyers. Barber is a pirate term. That is where bar association comes from, is barber law. And they don't have any right to practice or wield any control in your organization, not anywhere in America. And every physician in America needs to know that, is that you are a properly trained and duly licensed lawyer to take a case. There is not a single judge in America that's not a doctor that is qualified to see a case by America's constitutional standard. And we elaborate on that 
in perfecting the brand of American medicine. We dedicate a whole day of the week to that in the Divas calendar, which is Saturdays, Hippocratic French, which is law first medicine. And this is the real reform that will make America fantastic for all the tribes, for all of us, is that when you look at the small number of professions that are just talking and eating and thinking they're doing something, bar association law is one of the things that has to go. And like they can go practice in Canada, they can practice in Mexico. We don't need any of them here. Vote them all out of office, place them with physicians and medical scientists like things were run before. Like in, in the ancient chivalric past, when there were utopian style societies, you had smart, intelligent people that learned law by reading physician contracts, by reading hospital contracts, by purchasing and selling horses. You know, where there's the ancient Batavi, where the Batavi were the ones that domesticated the horse by legend. The Batavi are the ones that decided who would have an empire horses, who would have one, who would have none. In 1773, Jonas Great Battalion came to America and he said that America could have an empire of horses, you know, including Hippocrates, including physicians. Of which he built a hospital at West Point, which was one of the best in the whole world. And that, that tradition spread in orthopedics all throughout America. The Americans know that there's a Prussian and German connection to orthopedics. That guy that built West Point is the one. I happen to be descended of him. Proud of it. And see, he was a lawyer. He took cases. He was a doctor. He took cases. You, those of you out there that are good doctors, you can take a case. There's absolutely no barrier to you taking a case. Literally, every doctor is more qualified to weigh, you know, what's right judicially in a case. We offer a system. Uh, a magistrate judge system which large uh, Fortune 500 companies have compensated uh, me and my company to function as magistrate judges uh, because medical science is so much better than reading law. They, they see the results are so much better um, having people that actually know natural law, that know natural science, that actually know scientific laws, that know physical laws. Uh, it's so much better than someone that talks and eats. And so we invite you to join us every Saturday of Hippocratic French, which is a law first medicine, which is a tradition of good doctors uh, who would, would take a case. And sometimes that case was a legal case, sometimes that case they're asking to be a judge. Which is, it's natural for physicians because patients are coming to you to be a judge. There's no reason why physicians shouldn't take over all the judicial spots in all of America. Uh, join us at Profit. I mean, with perfecting the brand of American medicine. I happen to be descended of Pierre Respire Rison, who's a Frenchman that had a claim French king, uh, who uh, by covenant uh, reached Sir Henry Vaughan, who uh, he was the king of England, uh, to make a claim to all the minerals, all the resources uh, in what is now described as Canada. Uh, he had a claim on America as well. Uh, Pierre Spear Radisson um, is the father of brands, more or less, in the New World. He founded the Hudson Bay Colony. Uh, you know, which became Hudson Jewelers, of which there are other jewelry companies um, that um, grew out of that. Um, he coined, um, you know, that is a um, first class retail operation, which became Dayton's, which later became uh, Macy's. Uh, there were uh, other individuals that were descended of Pierre Spirit Radisson uh, that ended up uh, benefiting. Uh, from his uh, empire. Uh, my side of the family happened not to. We were not involved in the sale. Um, we would have gotten a much better price. Our side of the family is far more shrewd uh, business people. Uh, we invented the modern fire truck. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, my ancestor on my father's line, we, you know, uh, we ushered in the lingua franca era. Uh, and Napoleon Bonaparte the third usher in the lingua franca era and so no disrespect to the other side of the family um you know uh but the hudson jeweler empire uh traced back to uh, our side pierre spear Radisson. and what's so interesting about that is that what he found in creating the french uh, mineral um and uh you know garment trade textile trade was it happy, loyal, engaged employees make for happy, loyal, engaged patients? Happy, loyal, engaged people make for happy, loyal, engaged customers. And, and I'm saying the way that we say it in healthcare. But he was so critical in that idea, which is why 
um, Hudson is so um, synonymous with uh, quality, so synonymous with uh, high quality retail, um, is that Hudson Jewelers traces back to him, Hudson Bay traces back to him, even the name of the Hudson River traces back to him, coining that. Um, and uh, Pierre Spear Radisson uh, has had multiple uh, hotels uh, that trace back to him, multiple uh, financial um, organizations that trace back to him. Uh, and uh, what's so important uh, for your hospital, for your clinic, for your organization is uh, a roster of individuals that are capable of covering all the space, all the shifts, you know, seven days a week, uh, and still able to, um, you know, be happy, loyal, engaged people. And that, because see, happy, loyal, engaged people are the ones that um, produce the halo effect of, um, you know, self-referrals of word-of-mouth referrals back in to your hospital, your clinic, your organization. Uh, Pierre Spear Radisson is legendary in that. Um, he left, uh, you know, an incredible legacy that, you know, even a couple hundred years later, the Dutch West India Company was, you know, trying to build forts along the Hudson River because, you know, he had um, so well coined it as an important thoroughfare um, and, you know, that uh, led to the exciting uh, introduction of, you know, the uh, Jagiellonian Law uh, by uh, Pierre Spier uh, by uh, Joseph Grey Battalion in uh, 1773, um, you know, when he brought, you know, Prussian horses to America and built West Point, which was essential in the roster building system. Now, a roster is so important for your company. Uh, there is not a hospital, not a clinic uh, that we talk to that says, well, you know what, we have exactly the roster we need. Um, what's really interesting is that people don't advertise externally very well for what roster they have, and so they end up not able to articulate what their practice actually needs. And a lot of that traces back to there were 103 different good doctor traditions the Cold War. There's a French tradition or more, there's an English tradition or more, you know, there's a Prussian tradition or more. And uh, those traditions are so important uh, because through the Cold War they shrunk down here in America to just two medical sects. And, you know, those two sectarian options um, are asked to be everything to everybody. And so each doctor can select one of our seven chivalric orders where you have a prioritization of Hippocrates that works for you, whether it's Epicurean first case of Italian Medici Latin, ability first, workability first in the case of Kent English, life expectancy first in the case of Atlantis American, ability first in the case of Jotin Olympic, first night first as in quality first in the example of leading expect Jack Fedek, and uh, law first in the case of uh, the product French. Uh, and that tradition of you know, having a, an optimal roster we've seen uh, in other industries, if you look at baseball, baseball went through the uh, transformation of cybermetrics where data was used to evaluate uh, what the best players were for winning a game. Not the players that the scouts said that they needed, not the players that the fans said that they wanted, but the players that the data said needed to succeed. Now there's a lot of issues with going on data alone, of which we have 14 different contour systems uh, that are specified by your selection of your Hippocratic Oath, your prioritization of the Hippocratic Oath, talking to your physicians, talking to your clinics, talking to your hospitals. Your prioritization of the Hippocratic Oath will determine uh, what a contour system uh, you use in determining your roster. Um, a uh, candor-based system is a good system it uh, is not uh, the right system for everybody, um, and a lot of health systems have taken that approach of looking at um, a kind of sabermetric approach, of which that's a service that we offer. It's been very successful for us all over America. Uh, we offer that to your group, but we have 13 other contour systems that we use to help um, hospitals, clinics, physicians make that decision. And that's so ex you know so exciting. At Profit, I mean, is that there are all these 103 different Good Shepherd traditions that, you know, from before the Cold War that were lost. And, um, you know, here at Profit, I mean, where the guys reintroducing that. 
So we ask you guys to join us appropriately. There's a new ordination fee schedule for 10 accredited knighthoods, including at our Sir Henry Vaughan College of Knights, where those 10 fields of knighthood include a calculus doctorate, which surpasses uh, the Juris Doctorate um, in training in science and math, uh, which includes Regentin, a Cantor, Rengen, a Kyrios, uh, which is the source of the uh, knowledge uh, that we've used, and other um, ordination confirmations, uh, including new magistrate judges. We ask you to join us. There was a widow who lost her spouse, a good doctor, the love of her life, where she found herself in financial hardship. And so she cursed all the medical charts that were left littered around. And because she happened to be unaware of the ancient sacred of Gary. Gary is the ancient Jagthetic word, the sacrament of anointing the sick. She went to the king. And see, the king instructed her that those are Gere. That's the value of the practice. That's the balance sheet. That's what the practice is worth. And so she said that she could sell the charts, of which that's from way before the Cold War. Before the Cold War, there were 103 good doctor traditions there were 103 good Akantra traditions, of which the medical charts were the valuation of the practice. In the ancient world, the number of people working in a company, and those specific people, that roster, and the customers, was the balance sheet. People belong on the balance sheet. Generally accepted accounting principles suggest that on a balance sheet, you would include basically no people on it. I mean, basically none. And yet, riches are created by homo sapiens. You know, not by smaller, you know, things. You know, the machines have to work for us. If it makes sense having property plant equipment as an asset, it makes sense having homo sapiens as part of that story, as part of the balance sheet. And so we ask you to join us in this uh, new Akantar movement of having people on the employee roster as part of the balance sheet. Think of that widow, because her practice, her husband's practice was worth nothing, except the charts that came with it, and that was a long time ago. Where today, emergency room physicians have a life expectancy by some accounts this 58 years, it's so extraordinarily short. And yet those widows of emergency room doctors are not even allowed to sell the charts. The patients that that doctor's seen are not part of the balance sheet, not an accounting of what that doctor owns, not an accounting of what that doctor owes, neither. Nor the people that work for that doctor. And that needs to be solved. And so we have seven new chivalric domains. One for every day of the week, with 14 new chivalric orders that put people back on the balance sheet. Join us at Profi.me with the new Akantar movement.